For the past eight years, when the leaves turn, we've turned south and gone snowbirding in the desert southwest. This year, for the first time, we'll be spending the winter north in cooler climates. Today we're going to show you how we plan to stay warm and comfortable. We're going to start with the most obvious, and that is making sure that our water hose doesn't freeze. And the way we're going to do that is by wrapping the hose in aluminum foil. And then we're going to take the hose and lay it inside these foam tubes with the heat tape. So we wrap our water hose in aluminum foil, put it inside the split foam tube along with the heat tape running alongside it, and then pull these tapes down and seal it if you've got that type of uh, foam tube. Some have this and some don't. The purpose of the aluminum foil is to take the heat from the heat tape and conduct that heat all the way around the water hose. Since the water hose obviously isn't made of metal, it's not a good conductor, and we want to get the heat all the way around, so by wrapping it in aluminum foil, it accomplishes that. And once it's all sealed up, it's all going to look nice and clean all the way from one end to the other. Here's our first section of foam tubing completely attached to the hose and the heat tape. And we'll just keep adding sections of foam tubing to make the hose as long as needed. This is a 15 foot heat tape, so we have a couple more sections of foam tubing to add. Okay, we've attached one side of our hose to the city water outlet, and we've made sure to duct tape all the seams in our foam insulation, including the end. Now we've fed the water hose up into our water compartment, making sure that the heat tape is up inside the water compartment. And we've taken this spare hose and attached it to our regular water hose, putting a pressure regulator in line. You can see this is a very old pressure regulator. It looks worse than it is, it just has a lot of surface rust on the gauge. Now let's turn on the water and check for leaks at both ends. Of course we have to protect the water inlet from freezing also, so we're going to take another heat tape, more aluminum foil, and more tubing, and do the same thing on this end, thoroughly wrapping this up and protecting it from the cold. Now of course parts of the spigot here are too large for the foam tube to fit around, so we're going to use this uh, insulated heat wrap tape. Okay, we've insulated this from the ground right up onto the hose with the heat tape running the length of the standpipe here. That's completely insulated and you can see the thermostats for the heat tapes hanging off the other side and we have those plugged into a good quality extension cord, three prong, and you can see that when it's plugged in, the little orange light glows on top of the plug to let you know it's getting power. Now luckily we don't have to worry about protecting any of this from rain because Bridget and Greg's site has this great box that's built all around our hookups here. These thermostats are designed to turn on whenever the temperature drops below 45 degrees, so anytime it gets anywhere near freezing out here, the entire length of our fresh water hose all the way into the RV is going to be protected. Now that takes care of the fresh water. As far as gray water goes, the most important thing to protect your gray water from freezing is be certain that it flows continuously downhill. If it's laying on the ground and then goes up into the sewer connection, you're going to end up with a frozen sewer line. So we're lucky here because this site goes uphill and we have a very continuous straight downhill shot into the sewer. If it gets extremely cold out, we probably will stop running water through the gray tank and out to the sewer and simply close the gray valve and not open it until the temperature is above freezing. That's not a big deal. We don't fill up our gray tank that fast anyway, 
it's a fact of life up here in the mountains that mice want to get somewhere warm and we do occasionally get them on board. The trick is to fight them off as best you can by sealing up easy uh, places for them to come in and also catching them as quickly as possible before they can do any damage to wiring or anything else in the house. Maybe you're wondering how steel wool is going to stop mice from getting in. It happens to be one of the few things they won't chew through and one of the easiest ways for them to get inside is the sewer hose. It's like a ladder. They'll climb right up it and we have found mouse droppings in the water compartment in the past when we have gotten mice. And so we are going to seal up this opening right there with steel wool. This is the same 4 aught steel wool that we showed you in our video about how to super clean your windshield. Now we're putting it to another good use and as long as we don't get it wet it won't rust and we can still use it for cleaning our windshield. Now just in case that mice should get past this it's important that you catch them quickly. You don't want them damaging things inside the RV. And a couple of steps to make sure that our water compartment stays above freezing during the winter. A 60 watt light bulb. Now we've read that anywhere from 40 to 100 watts is what's needed to keep the water compartment, water pipes, water pump all above freezing. We're going to try 60 and see how that works out and we have a way of monitoring that also. We have an indoor outdoor thermometer and we usually keep the outdoor part of it under the hood right here. We're going to take that out of its clip for the winter and use it in the water compartment. We're just going to take this sending unit and set it back here which happens to be right by our water pump and a lot of our water hoses and that will tell us at all times inside the RV what the temperature is down here. Now we can keep tabs on the temperature down in the water bay which is the upper reading here 54.1 right now with that light bulb down there. Now there's one other step we're going to take to make sure that our basement water area stays above freezing and that is we're going to turn on the basement heater blower fan that we have down here and that'll make sure that our furnace, when we use it, blows air down into the basement. If you're wondering why we'd put a light bulb down here, when we have a blower in the basement that comes off the furnace, and the reason we need that light bulb down there is because we don't want to use the furnace more than necessary because it's our single biggest user of propane. Without running the furnace, the blower down in the basement is not going to blow air down into the water compartment. So we have that light bulb down there to make sure that even if we don't use the furnace, it won't freeze down in the basement. We also have the advantage of a large external propane tank that's here on Bridget and Greg's site where we'll be staying this winter. We're going to hook into that. Connecting to the big external propane tank will be easy because when we plumbed our barbecue grill into the big tank, we used a device called an extend-a-stay and this cap comes off and allows us to connect to an external propane tank. Our RV came from the factory with three built-in sources of heat. We have heat pumps as one source of heat. Two of them, one front, one back, although they only work down to about 40 degrees or so. Or the furnace for the whole house which runs on propane. So two heat pumps that run off electricity, one propane furnace. The problem with all three of those is that they are large users of power. The heat pumps use a lot of electricity and the furnace uses a lot of propane. Every source of heat has its pros and cons. The furnace uses a lot of propane but it's good for boondocking because it doesn't use a lot of electricity and propane is a pretty hardy resource. Heat pumps run off electricity, which you may already be paying for at a campground, especially if you're staying by the day or a week. You're probably not paying extra for electricity in that case. The problem with heat pumps is that they only work down to about 40 degrees or so. Below 40 degrees are not able to pull enough heat out of the air to work. 
we've added two sources of heat to the RV that didn't come with it. One of them is an oscillating electric heater. And this is terrific because it draws very little power, runs on about 8 amps or so on high, and keeps the room nice and warm while having the benefit of drying the air out while it's running. This little propane heater is very popular down in quartzite because it's perfect for boondocking. It uses zero electricity and sips propane. This of course requires a source of propane and you can see the hose that comes out of the back of it. We install this ourselves which we don't really recommend. Uh, we didn't do a how-to video on how to do it because we don't think it's really something that most people should be doing but you can see we teed into the propane line that goes to our stove and ran it down to the floor and underneath the cabinetry here and right over here to a quick release valve and now that can come out and under the couch and run across to the propane heater. We used a quick release valve because our connection is in a slide out and we wanted to be able to disconnect that hose when we're not using it and when we put the slide in. That heater puts out a ton of heat and uses a very small amount of propane. The only problem with it is that it creates moisture when you burn propane inside the house which means you have to crack a window anytime you use it and one of the biggest things you have to deal with during the winter inside the RV is moisture so we have to carefully balance how much we use the propane heater versus the electric heater and make sure that we open a window when we're using it. Using any propane appliance inside the RV whether it's the stove or a propane heater, uses oxygen. Cracking the window a little bit not only reduces moisture, but makes sure you'll have plenty of air to breathe. The three biggest moisture producers in the RV are showering, cooking, and breathing. One tip for reducing moisture and humidity from showering is to squeegee the walls and the glass off when you're done to get that water down the drain instead of evaporating in the shower. Extremely important for moisture control is the ability to have your fans on regardless of the weather. Could be raining or snowing. You have to be able to open your roof vents in any kind of weather. That means that winter RVing demands that you have roof vent covers. If moisture is condensing on your windows, it could also be forming inside your walls, creating mold and mildew problems. Even though we had no intention of staying in cold climates when we ordered the RV, we selected the tank heat pad option just in case. Now we're glad we did. These will heat the holding tanks to prevent them from freezing in extremely cold temperatures. We've also seen aftermarket heat pads available for travel trailers and fifth wheels that have their tanks accessible for installation. We generally keep the heat set to around 55 degrees at night and we're able to do that because our bed linens are very warm. We use flannel sheets in the winter, a fleece blanket, and a down comforter. So we have lots to keep us warm. We also have an electric mattress pad, which is great for preheating the bed before you get in. Hopefully you can use some of the tips we've provided today to keep cozy and warm while winter RVing.